You all set? Yeah, I'm all good on my end. Okay, perfect. So let me, I'm just trying to adjust my screen. Is there a way we can fix the screen so I can see everyone? I, it says my video can't be started because it has stopped. I don't know if you can hear me if I'm- I can hear you, Councilman. It, it, should, it should be all set now, sorry about that. Okay, hold on one second. All right, let's see here. Okay. I'm also trying to adjust it so I can see everyone. Okay, perfect. Um, perfect. Hey, you guys. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all. And uh, my sincere apologies for the delay, but you'll appreciate we were just uh, reviewing grants for all of your departments with your incredible colleagues um, from FIRE as well as uh, BPD. So thank you. Apologies for the delay. Good to see everyone. I'm going to just uh, start us off with obviously a script for uh, logistical purposes, and then we will jump in. And thank you, uh, Shane and, and Carrie as well. So for the record, uh, my name is Andrea Campbell. I'm Boston City Councilor for District 4. I chair the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. I am joined by my council colleagues. I know Councilor Mejia is here. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anyone. Councilor Mejia is here for now and as others join, I will recognize them. Uh, this is a public hearing. It is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will rebroadcast on Xfinity channel eight, RCN channel 82, Verizon Files channel 1964. We will take public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you wish to testify, please email shane.packpac at boston.gov to sign up. Um, and we will ask that you state your name for the record and offer comments that are no more than two minutes. You can also submit written testimony by emailing ccc.ps at boston.gov. Today's hearing is on docket numbers 0323 a hearing, an order for a hearing to explore and recommend diversity initiatives for the city of Boston's public safety agencies. We are joined by several, several members of the administration from the police department, fire department, human resources, and EMS. So thank you all for being here. Um, today, the purpose of the hearing is a hearing that I called as chair of public safety uh, to look at the diversity and to get updates on the diversity numbers and strategies uh, with respect to our Boston public safety agencies. I appreciate everyone being here. I will keep my comments really brief and then uh, we'll turn it over to some folks from the administration. Um, or I'm sorry, start with my council colleagues for any opening remarks and then turn it over to folks from the administration. So increasing uh, diversity in our public safety agencies, I think is an important piece of our broader work to reform and transform our public safety system to be more equitable and more just, which means of course, not only eliminating racism and bias in these systems, but ensuring the jobs, which are very high paying are accessible to everyone and that the departments reflect the communities they serve. We know this is critically important to build trust with residents um, and also with our departments. We don't need another report. There are many that tell us that this is, the, that this is true. And while we've had some progress, there's still a lot more work to do. And though Boston is a majority minority city, our public agencies are still overwhelmingly white. Boston residents make up 44.9% white, 22.7% black, 19% Hispanic, 9.4% Asian. And yet many of our departments are still not only at the lower tier ranks, but at the higher ranks within our departments, overwhelmingly white. Two years ago, uh, I was blessed to actually work with many folks in the department, as well as advocates um, from the community, including veterans, to talk about how we expand diversity, our diversity numbers in all of our public safety agencies. After several conversations and hearings and a series of conversations, um, the work started in 2018. We held a hearing on June 14 in, um, in 2018. I put forward a report of my own recommendations as to how we would get there and what specific things the city of Boston could do to expand and increase diversity, especially in our leadership positions in all of these departments. I worked with each and every one of the departments, including many that are on this call, including our chief diversity officer, 
uh, to compile information, to reflect upon it, to think about it, and then of course to put forth recommendations. The hearing today is designed to have an update on those recommendations and a conversation about what has been done and where we wanna go from here. Um, I will, before I turn it over to the administration, I do want to um, have Council Mejia, if you have any opening remarks, um, I'd like to give you the floor. And then after that, I'll turn it over uh, to the administration I'll start with a couple of questions just on the current numbers in our departments and then um, uh, go to each department for some opening remarks. But Council Mejia, I will start with you. Thank you for being here. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Campbell, for bringing this issue to the Council. As the Chair of Committee of Small Business and Workforce Development, I'm incredibly interested in finding ways to diversify our police force. In the hearing we were just came from, one of the doctors talked about finding ways to enhance community trust. Yeah. One way to do that is to have a police force that looks and talks more like the people that they serve. I look forward to finding ways to achieve that goal and working to replicate that across all city agencies. Thank you so much for bringing this to the table and look forward to being a thought partner um, with our uh, police force uh, to close this gap. Thank you, Council Mejia. And I do wanna stress, we're definitely gonna be talking to, of course, the police department on their diversity numbers, but we wanna look at this issue across every public safety agency, because we know fire is different than police and EMS, of course, different than fire and police, but all critically important to the work we do um, in the city of Boston. So thank you all for your leadership. Um, I also wanna acknowledge we've been joined by Councilor Liz Braden. Councilor, do you have any opening remarks you'd like to speak to before I um, jump right in? No, I um, please jump right in, um, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, you're muted. Thank you, Shane. Um, and feel free, all of you can unmute yourself and say, Councillor, you're muted. We can't hear a word you're saying. Um, so I, I'll start with you, uh, Chief Tavares, but before we, and I'll have you direct which department head or, or who you want to go first, but before we do that, it would be great to paint the picture, right? So if we could provide really quickly for council colleagues, um, as well as the public, the current numbers of each department. Um, I have numbers from 2018, I'm not sure. I think there's been some changes. So if you have current numbers as to uh, the number of police officers that are broken down by race and gender, the same with fire and the same with EMS. Um, and then of course, the same for top tier positions. So this is of course, lieutenants, captains, superintendents, that would be helpful to start with. I could read mine, but they're 2018. Councilor, should I, should I just proceed? Yes, that'd be great. Uh, afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Councillor Braden, um, Councillor Mejia, thank, thanks for having me today. As you mentioned, Councillor, this is a conversation that we, start, we started over two years ago. Um, I'm joined by several members of the administration today from all the public safety agencies. And, and to your point, we've asked them to come prepared with all the information. So as they dive in, um, maybe they can start with the current numbers. Um, just, just talking holistically, th there's been a lot of progress made in, in the past two years. Um, as you may recall, there were several recommendations put forth uh, two years ago. Um, we're happy to report we've moved forward on several of those recommendations, including the recommendations that have been put forth by the mayor's task, um, task force that I just convened. Um, so we believe we have a really good story to share, um, including a lot of progress we've made over the last two years. So, so we're happy to dive into this conversation. Um, so while we start this, um, we could go around and maybe um, of, of, uh, Gaskins, Michael Gaskins, if you want to start with the police numbers and then we can go to Chief Hooley for the EMS numbers. Um, and then Commissioner, we could go to you for the fire numbers and then circle back around uh, to you, Chief um, Tavares, to talk about some updates and then um, go from there. Sounds good. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Great to see you. Good to be seen, ma'am. Um, so for Boston Police right now, uh, for our sworn personnel, you just want to get Want me to uh, go into just our sworn personnel as it relates to where we are right now, or do you want me to talk about the last four classes in terms of recruitment? 
the the sworn personnel as it right, relates right okay. now, as it is yes. right now. Yes, so ma'am, I have 2,000 plus officers. Yeah. So we have 2,750, uh, um, uh, excuse me, 2,000. Let me just make sure I give you the 2,132 uh, for as far as sworn personnel. Right now, we're currently at 64% uh, white American. That includes 58.9% male, 6.8% female. We're at 21% African American. That includes 16.3% male, 5% uh, female. We're at 9.6% Latin American or Latinx. That includes 8.9% male, 1.7% female, and we are at currently around 2% uh, Asian American, which is 2.1% male, 0.3% female. What's the total female that, uh, I know you did the breakdown, just curious, total, I mean, I think in 2018, it was 13% female, right? I think we've obviously gone up since then. Uh, let me see what I have for that. Um, I'd have to do some quick math in terms of uh, calculation, but uh, we have gone up uh, considerably, especially over the past uh, three uh, recruit classes. Um, we saw a record number in uh, 2019 of 30% uh, of our class, um, which equal 32, uh, were women. So we, we have seen a marked increase. I could uh, do some calculation real quick and let you know how many uh, women we have across the board. That'd be great. That's 294, ma'am. Okay, thank 294. I can do the percentage. Um, okay, and then just top tier, Michael, that'd be great. Uh, top tier, um, there, there have been some recent uh, changes in terms of the appointments, uh, deputy superintendent, superintendent, but um, the uh, commissioner Gross has appointed uh, uh, with with the uh, um, input of uh, the mayor has appointed the most diverse um, command staff in the history of the department. Um, and I can, um, I'd have to, again, I, 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 uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but um, I can look at the, um, the uh, numbers and report that back as soon as possible as, as we're, as we're no, in that'd be great. conversation. Um, yes, man. And I do want to acknowledge Councilor Flynn's been uh, joined us. Thank you, Councilor Flynn, for being here. So I had, you know, um, Michael, I had 121 BPD. This was lieutenants, captains, superintendents, 86% white, 12% black, 2% Hispanic, 1% Asian, 7% female. But this was in 2018. So if you have updated numbers for that, we can come back, but that would be great. Uh, yes, ma'am. Again, I'm looking across the board here uh, right now um, of the, the 10 uh, superintendents that we have, uh, five are white male, one is a white female, three are black male, uh, one is a black, uh, black male, and then deputy superintendents uh, of the 12, uh, four white male, one white female, two black male, two black female, two uh, Hispanic male, and then one Asian male. Um, captains, which again, we probably won't see a lot of uh, movement in the captains area, because uh, it has to do with applicant pools and the number of people that take the test at the time. So we're still drawing from the 2015 test. Uh, but right now we have, uh, of the 22 captains, uh, 19 are white male, but we have two black males and one Hispanic male. Thank you. Uh, I'll go on to, uh, and then I'm gonna circle back around, just giving, getting updated numbers and also to share with colleagues. Uh, Chief Hooley, hi, good to see you. It'd be great to, if you could give us an update on, um, you know, your technicians and of course, in terms of numbers and breakdown, because we have the 2018 numbers. Sure. <clears throat> and then of course your, your, 
your chief superintendents, captains, lieutenants, and great to see you. And thank you, of course, for your, your leadership and work as well. No, thank you. Uh, good, good to see you as well. Thanks. Uh, let me see. Quickly want to acknowledge that Councilor Flaherty is also on. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Back to you, Chief Uli. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're uh, <clears throat> we're just pulling up the uh, uh, those senior ranks uh, up there, but day because that that changed quite a bit since the uh, the last time uh, I think we reported. But uh, I'll, I'll start off with the uh, uh, general overall uh, numbers. We currently have uh, 379 uniform uh, full time employees. Uh, of all ranks uh, were budgeted for 399. So that uh, means we have a uh, uh, 20 vacancies. We're actually currently in the process of uh, 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 preparing for the next recruit class. We uh, we just, we had written exams and practical exams this week. And the interviews were actually going on, uh, they started today. So they're they're ongoing, they started uh, today. So we're, uh, we're hoping to uh, fill up uh, those positions as well and get you an update on that. On uh, uh, for, uh, for the overall uh, uh, numbers, we see uh, the change right now uh, on, on race and gender. On white, it's 73%. It was previously reported at 68%. Uh, black was at 13%, uh, which is this, uh, uh, no change. Uh, Hispanic, 9% uh, is the current, uh, where previously it had been seven. Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, that's uh, up to 4% now, that had been uh, 1%. And female has remained constant at uh, 32% back in the previous report and in um, this most recent one. We have, uh, we do have uh, uh, nine people who, uh, who I, again, it, it's it's self-identified. So we do have nine people who have, uh, uh, what's the word, um, who chose to remain unspecified, and uh, uh, five people who uh, selected uh, two or more. So that's 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 how they're captured in the public health stats. Uh, on the uh, command structure. Uh, so deputy, deputy superintendents, superintendents, chief, uh, 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 five out of the C, uh, five out of the 17 are uh, identified as uh, black, that's 29%, uh, 6% uh, Hispanic, and uh, uh, and let me see, so the, uh, the remainder there would be, uh, uh, would be uh, uh, white, whatever. I'll have to type this up. Very helpful. Yeah, and the last, uh, since since I, I, I can't remember the last we spoke, I think, I think this was filed back in uh, February. I know just uh, just a couple of other changes in the uh, and the uh, uh, superior ranks since then uh, on the uh, on a few of the uh, uh, promotions. Uh, uh, there's a couple of people. One of them is actually joining us today. She'll be uh, presenting on uh, some of our information today. Uh, Deputy Superintendent Lee Alexander. Okay. I think I think I believe you met her out at Codman Square. Uh, mm -hmm. That's right. When, when that tragedy happened outside, but yeah, unfortunately, Deputy Superintendent with us now. And uh, she's taking on some expanded duties overseeing uh, our diversity recruitment and uh, engagement and a lot of employee development uh, focus. And uh, we uh, really recently uh, uh, promoted uh, two paramedics, one uh, 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 black male, Gavi Cameron, who's now a shift commander, and uh, 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 Janela Menez, who's a um, uh, 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 Latina paramedic, they've both, both uh, become deputy superintendents and they'll be functioning as uh, shift, uh, shift commanders as well. Okay. Of course, I'll get this on writing to update for you. No, this is great. Thank you. Um, and then now I'll quickly go to uh, Commissioner. Good to see you on just the fire numbers and then I'll circle back around for some quick presentations and then I'll open it up to colleagues. 
Okay, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and, and all the councils and everyone on. Uh, so let me just give you a quick breakdown of the, uh, the percentage here. Uh, so we have uh, 1,474 firefighters, uh, that's including all ranks. And of that, uh, 275 are black, which is 18.7%. Uh, 120 are Hispanic, that's 8.1%. 15 are Asian for 1%. And 1,064 white, uh, that's 72.2%. Uh, of that, uh, 19 are females, and that's a 1.3%. Our, our last class had two females in it. Uh, we're currently, so, and in our hiring process, we'll, and I'm sure you'll ask this, uh, as you already know, uh, we're bound by civil service law, so, uh, but, but we're work, working on some uh, different ways. And one is, is uh, the language list, certification list, uh, which we're forming a new class right now. Uh, and out of the 50, 55 possible recruits we're gonna have, 15 of those will be language. So uh, now let me uh, give you a breakdown on the uh, ranking system. Uh, so uh, out of black firefighters, we have, uh, uh, let me see here. We currently have one deputy chief. Uh, we had two, but one retired uh, this past year. Uh, we have uh, six black district chiefs, seven black captains, 36 black lieutenants, and 227 uh, firefighters for a total of 275. Hispanic, we have uh, two district chiefs, four captains, 16 lieutenants, and 98 firefighters for a total of 120. Asians, we have uh, 15 firefighters. Uh, none of them are officers. Uh, that's, that's, that's up considerably from a few years back where I believe we only had one Asian on the job. So uh, we've made a lot of strides in that area. Uh, white, uh, we have 20 deputy chiefs, 45 district chiefs, 67 captains, and 173 lieutenants, 759 firefighters for a total of 1,064. If we go down to the gender breakdown, uh, under the females, we have uh, two Asians, we have 10 blacks, two Hispanics, and five whites for a total of uh, 19. And I Males, we have, uh, oh, okay, I think I kind of covered the males on the uh, breakdown. Uh, that none, of, none of that include, that doesn't include fire alarm operators. So I, did you wanna, want me to go over those numbers with you or? No, that's okay. Thank you, Commissioner. But we'll, we'll get those separately and, and, and follow up to also get all of this in writing too. I took yep. notes of course too. Yep. Okay, uh, perfect that for me then. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go back uh, to you, Chief Tavares, and and I know we're way behind time, so I apologize in advance. I know how busy you guys are, so I will go to you, Chief Tavares, for um, some updates, and then specifically, you know, the purpose of the hearing too is to go through the recommendations in the report, of course, to to see what we've done, where we need to collaborate to do better, that kind of thing. And then of course, I wanna make sure I give uh, opportunity to my council colleagues as well to, to chime in. So maybe I'll give you, I don't know, five minutes. Sure, sure. Um, so, I, so I think, you know, um, just, look, just looking broadly at our public safety offices, there's been a lot of conversation on how do we get the numbers up. Um, I think starting from two years ago um, to now, we, we've adopted a lot of new tools, which we think are gonna be helpful. A lot of the recommendations that have been put forth has to deal around um, you know, BPD has a great fr framework in their cadet program. And I know the, a lot of the answers to fire has been, how do we create something similar? Since the last time we had this hearing, we've since filed the um, 
that legislation that's now cleared the House of Representatives is now in the Senate. And we're cautiously, cautiously optimistic, optimistic that that's going to pass. In addition, um, BPD has done a great job with their cadet programs. Um, one, one way we've been able to sort of make sure we're diversifying and getting neighborhood kids is through our cadet program. And, and, and we've had a class that was 50% um, women. And, and so that's a nice, that's been a great tool in making sure that we've been able to move the gender piece as well. Um, but I think I would say that um, more holistically that we, we've had a lot more strategic approach, um, not just to our public agency officers, but equity across the whole as we can sort of go forward. As you may know, the, the mayor has since hired Chief Carolyn Crockett as the chief equity officer. She, she's been in the process of building out her team. Um, in the meantime, we've added chief diversity officers in our public, um, in the BPDA, um, in fire, in police. Um, we're looking at in tech and in, in IT. So I think there's been um, a lot more strategic coordination around equity and making sure that we're sort of al aligning all of these sort of visions as we go forward. Um, on top of that, we've built on the recommendations of the residency requirement. There's been a home rule petition to move the residency requirement from one to three years. Um, we think that's going to give us the ability to pull in a lot more neighborhood kids into the fold. Um, part of the recommendations that came out of the task force was, was one of the recommendations you had put forth was looking at civil service. Um, there has been um, a recommendation put forth by the task force to add a preference, a, um, a secondary preference for BPS grads. Um, that's something the mayor has committed to looking at. Um, so a lot, there's a lot of plans in motion um, <clears throat> to continue to build on these efforts. Um, I'm, I'm gonna allow the public safety agencies just to get a little bit more into their recruitment practices, what they've done in terms of outreach, creating partnerships and engagement, um, getting the Vulcans involved with the firefighters in terms of recruitment, I think has been a great partnership. Um, the first female um, officer that was hired in BFD came from the language certification. Um, so I think that, that's a great story and that's something that BPD and BFD are going to continue to use as a tool going forward. Um, so, I, so I think we're doing everything within the framework of what we can to, to continue to diversify department. Um, that's on the personnel front. At the same time, we're looking at, you know, trainings on how do we build culture across the administration. Um, and we're engaged now with consultants to look at racial equity trainings, not just in public safety, but across um, the entire administration, which would apply to all 18,000 plus of our employees. This would be the first time we'd ha we've had such a robust training that touches everyone from leadership down, um, down, the, down the organization. Um, so we, we've got a lot of these motions um, sort of already, already underway. But I would love for sort of our public safety agencies to have the chance to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the efforts they've made to sort of um, build new partnerships and help sort of move the needle on some of these numbers. Yeah, before I go, just thank you, Chief Tavares. And before I go to department heads for just a quick opening or, or a little bit more um, to share before and, and then going to council colleagues, two questions. Um, one is on the data dashboard, I mean, Obviously, before George Floyd, before the task force, we had been talking about lack of diversity and working as a, you know, in collaboration with all of us on the Zoom to change that. I think we all care deeply about the issue. I'm not going to try to suggest we don't. Um, one of the recommendations was releasing the data on our public safety dashboard, right? So that you as a lay person and citizen could go on and see what the diversity numbers were for each department. So essentially what the, the chairs, um, and chief diversity officers and commissioners and chiefs just shared. Is that available? Is that available? And if, if not, which I don't think it is, the last I checked, when do we see that happening? Because it goes to just the transparency piece. When do we see that data being accessible on the dashboard? And then my second question is on civil service. Yes, I, I you know, in the hearing we held, all pathways are good. BPS pathway, I think it's all, I think it's all incredible. One of the recommendations was us specifically studying civil service. And this actually came from the veterans yep. and looking at the pros and cons of civil service on our public safety hiring, on our public safety promotions. Curious if we've explored as, as a city to either get, do it in partnership with say MAPC, who's done it with other municipalities um, or someone else to, to really have a deep dive versus waiting for the state, which can take forever. So those are my two questions directed for you. And then I'll, I'll, um, 
allow our commissioners and chiefs to talk for a few minutes. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the, on the data piece first. Um, when, when it comes to the dashboard, I, I think what you're currently looking at is, the, is our first iteration of the dashboard. I think there's been a lot of requests, not only on public safety to see to your point, the leadership breakdown, but, but a whole other slate of, of categories, including disability and sort of veterans categories. So um, the answer is yes, we're, we're currently working with all of our public aid, aid, safety agencies to update that information into the new iteration of the, the dashboard, which we hope to launch this spring. Um, so that that information is forthcoming. Um, on the answer on, on the question of civil service, um, part of the recommendations that came out of the task force was a review of the current civil service process. Um, one of the recommendations that called forth was a preference for um, high school graduates of BPS, which is a civil service issue. And so the mayor's adopted the recommendations from the task force, which which called for a, a review um of, of the civil service process in, in, in what it's had in terms of equity um for hiring okay i would just say i think with the data that we just listed should be out there i mean we've talked about this yesterday yep. and i think we should be doing our own more comprehensive study of civil service the pros and cons because there are good things there's benefits yep. um i just think it's it allows us to have a more thoughtful conversation on what we could do with civil service, if anything at all, in terms of diversity. And council, the, the one thing I would note on civil service is, um, you know, I think Boston is, is in a unique position than most cities and towns when it comes to, to civil service. If you look at civil service across the state, I think it tends to work pretty well for most um, cities and towns. With I think Boston is an outlier in that, um, you know, Boston's where everyone wants to be, right? And so I think, um, you know, it's more specific to Boston than across the board, I think. But but to your point, I do think a thorough review, um, which yeah, the Yeah, I mean, we already know there's about 17 municipalities have opted out of civil service entirely for their public safety agencies, or there's some others that are considering, you know, do we do a point system like the state police or something else, but just need more information there. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with you, Michael, to give you a few minutes and then I'll go to commissioner, I'm sorry, to Chief Hooley, then I'll go to the commissioner and then I'll open it up to council colleagues. Um, I'll give you each a few minutes if that works and then I'll go to council colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so my position as uh, you, you're aware uh, was created in 2017 and we've made uh, tremendous strides. I'm the diversity recruitment officer and examination administrator for the Boston Police Department. I am committed to this uh, recruitment of sworn personnel and cadets. Um, I also uh, oversee the promotional exam planning uh, process, planning and execution process. We just uh, uh, executed uh, the last phase of our promotional exam for sergeants, um, but we, um, we uh, executed the uh, promotional exams for all three ranks uh, between September and uh, December. Uh, so um, we've seen some uh, progress uh, in our recruit classes in particular with regard to our outreach, we partner with the city of Boston's career fair series, local colleges, universities, um, boys and girls clubs, YMCAs. I, I serve on the board um, on, uh, for the English um, high schools, uh, legal and protective studies uh, curriculum. Um, so we, we um, believe we have good partnerships and good uh, conduits in order for uh, people to be aware of the types of positions in the process uh, to, uh, to uh, become a, a, a police officer. Um, this starts with even just a presence on the city of Boston's website. So boston.gov forward slash police. Um, that was one of the initiatives that we took from a uh, marketing and information uh, standpoint. Uh, we also host uh, information sessions throughout the uh, city. And uh, most of them are centrally located at the bowling building. Um, and most of them um, have upwards of a uh, hundred plus attendees at each. And we just recently uh, did our first virtual info session. Uh, we invite our, our city uh, agency uh, colleagues along as well. Um, um, both BFD and EMS have been uh, at our, our uh, as guests to our, um, to our inf information sessions, including the, uh, the park services. So um, in terms of you know, our, our full uh, approach to, to recruitment, we have seen an uptick, um, especially as it relates to uh, our female recruits. Um, from 2016, 
uh, we had, it was upwards of a small number, but uh, out of the 56 uh, recruits, uh, we had uh, 78% were uh, white American. Um, and then 2017, uh, when I came on board, uh, we saw that number from the white American male uh, number go from the 70, 70 plus percent to uh, 60 percent. And we're hovering around between uh, 59, 60 percent now each class. And so incrementally, we've seen um, numbers a little bit more balanced from our recruit class. Um, it could lend to the number of um, overall recruits that we have. We have a, a larger number as opposed to um, a, a smaller class size. Um, but I, I wanna say we, we can point directly to um, promotions and um, partnerships with civil service. Whereas the 2019 test um, shows that for the Boston residents, we've had the most diverse applicant pool um, actually register and uh, take that particular exam. Um, as we've done our first draw from that list, um, we, we intend to uh, continue to draw from that list until it expires in uh, 2021. But we've seen a pretty uh, good uh, balanced class as we just put in a class as of November 30th, 2020. Um, and of the 110, uh, we're showing 65% uh, white American, that includes nine women. Um, and so again, with the, with the male uh, percentage, we would say we're still hovering around the uh, 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 60 percent uh, percentile for a uh, white American male, 19 uh, percent uh, Latinx, 13 percent Black American, and 3 percent Asian American. Um, so we, we, again, we're, we're maintaining that number of uh, women, uh, female recruits. Um, we're very excited about that. And we're also uh, maintaining the uh, secondary languages that are reported. Um, we make it a general practice to include language certification every time we, um, we uh, uh, ask for a list. Um, we, we intend to do that uh, moving forward and we continue to partner with uh, Boston Fire. Um, we were successful in um, sharing information in 2018 when we were granted language certification. This most recent time, um, I think it had more to do with timing. We weren't granted uh, language certification, but uh, uh, they, were, they were happy to share uh, their uh, successes uh, early on in the year. And we look to, to duplicate that for the next draw. No, that's very helpful. Um, and that collaboration across department too. So thank you. I'm gonna go to Chief Hooley. Um, I don't know if you want Lieutenant Alexander to speak, but I'll defer to you and then I'll go to commissioner. Okay, no, thank you. And uh, I just, uh, too quick, I, I was, uh, I was going to hand off something to uh, Deputy Alexander here in a second, but uh, when I was uh, uh, trying to look back at some of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> just, just you know, just to give you one example of uh, just yeah, even even some of the as we try to make progress, there's, there's still uh, you know challenges, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, because as I was stating earlier, that currently, uh, you know, the Deputy Superintendent rank, which is one of our most senior positions in Boston EMS. You know, it provides oversight for the majority of our workforce is the most diverse rank in Boston EMS now with five out of 12 of the members, uh, that's 42% being female, five out of 12, 42% being persons of color. And uh, as well as our training captains who are up uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, the second most uh, diverse rank in our department with two out of five being persons of color and uh, two out of five being women. Uh, the opportunities for promotion then, that means that you're drawing from some of the lower ranks or in, or in the case of the deputies, we wound up, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, indirectly uh, you know, reducing diversity at the paramedic uh, uh, rank. So our, our choice now is to develop more people to be uh, ready to take uh, the uh, paramedic exams when we do our next uh, rounds of uh, promotion there. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, on, on the idea in, in your document, uh, uh, Council, uh, when you know one of the things you're there, Patsy, about coordinating recruiting efforts, uh, we we try to look uh, beyond not just working with BPD, BFD, but uh, a lot looking at other city departments, BCYF, OWD, uh, uh, a lot of the bus public health uh, areas, and but I think who's best to speak to it would be uh, uh, Deputy Lee Alexander. So, Lee, if you don't mind. Thank you. 
Good morning, Councillor. Thank you for um, having me. Um, so just some of the coordinating um, recruiting efforts that, that I've taken on um, along with department members in a, sh a few short months have been, um, you know, recruiting, engagement, so keeping our existing members involved and engaged, but also recruiting new members to um, increase our selection pool. Um, so the department has invested funds where we um, recently did some radio ads. Um, we reached out on, you know, uh, uh, 96.9, which is very popular amongst the, the youth and the community. Um, so we had members, uh, myself included, but there's a group of members of color that created a organization called United Coalition of Emergency Medical Service Providers, USEP for short. Um, so a couple of those members, myself included, we did a radio ad just kind of highlighting perks of the job and just trying to um, inspire the youth to, to either go to the website, which would also gear them towards the, the mayor's office of workforce development. Um, and through the office of workforce development, um, there's opportunity for city residents to get free tuition towards our Boston EMS run EMT course, uh, which coincidentally lines up with our hiring process. So the thought is to get folks from the radio ad into Office of Workforce Development into the upcoming um, EMT course. And hopefully um, when the EMT course is completed, that will lead into the next hiring process. So we'll have all the information new and fresh and they'll be successful. Um, so along with that, uh, we've also been working with the Boston Public Health Commission where they have um, BAHEC. Um, so they're teaching 40 students um, all from inner city schools and some metro schools as well, um, and just getting them inspired towards a career in EMS. Um, I've spoken on um, some webinars with them and we've had other guest um, employees of color that have spoken about, you know, highlights of the career, being in the city, um, you know, just encouraging them with the potential for a, a nice income that'll set their family up well. Um, so along with that, We've also coordinated with, um, I've reached out to Michael Gaskins as well, who's you know, kept me on a, a really good path as far as ideas and innovations and that sort of thing. Um, so we have, I've worked with um, the GROW group. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's a youth group of young ladies of color within the city. Um, a lot of them are high school students. I've talked to them about the career um, as an EMT and how they can potentially move up the ranks. So a lot of um, different outreach and events. Um, we're working across with um, FIRE as well. We, did, we hosted a, well, they hosted a summer event where we were invited with our summer interns. Um, we talked to their summer interns or their summer academy and you know, said, maybe FIRE is a career, maybe it isn't, but this is also a career. So it was hundreds of um, inner city youth um, that were very attentive. So along with that, we're just, um, we're exploring career days, um, Zoom career days. We're also working with um, the Private Industry Council who um, they're, they're more health career focused and that sort of thing. Um, so coming in January, we're gonna do a lot of Zoom webinars. Um, and actually just before this hiring process, the Office of Workforce Development created a set of videos explaining the process um, there were three separate one hour sessions where they had over 30 minutes of open Q&A where they can ask anything and everything. And we had members available to answer all the questions. You know, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and just the collaboration, you know, I think a couple of years ago and one department was doing one thing and finding it challenging. So I, I really appreciate these updates. Commissioner, I'll, I'll go over to you um, for updates and then I'm gonna go to my colleagues who have been patiently waiting. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the Boston Fire Department is open to exploring all avenues of partnerships that will augment and complement its own recruiting efforts. And so I wanted to thank the uh, police and EMS for uh, any collaboration we have with them. Uh, they're they're a, a great resource for us 
And I know we'll be reaching out to the uh, police uh, on the cadet program as well. Uh, currently, the Boston Fire Department's recruiting efforts are done by its diversity recruitment officer and by a recruit team comprised of minority firefighters detailed to headquarters from the field in months leading up to the firefighter exams every year. <clears throat> every year that it, that's every other year. Uh, for the past couple of years, recruiting is nonetheless done throughout the entire year by an ad hoc team of firefighters, including the department's female liaison and the Boston Fire Department's public information officers. Um, we also have uh, the Teen Academy, which is run during the summer, uh, which is a great program. Uh, back in 2017, I believe we had 20, uh, 20 kids in there. Uh, this year, largest ever, uh, we had over 50. So uh, it's a, it's, that's run by minority uh, firefighters uh, volunteering to do this and mentoring the kids. And uh, it's, it's been a great success. Uh, we also bring the police in there and EMS and, and, and military recruiters. Uh, so they get, they get uh, a lot of uh, counseling and uh, direction. So it's great, great for them. The other thing we do is the community enrichment program, which is run by uh, minority firefighters and they mentor these kids. They play basketball, it's a basketball league and it's, it's run at BCYF facilities. And uh, once again, it's a great chance to uh, uh, play basketball with the kids, talk to them, mentor them. And uh, that, that's been a huge success. And we're gonna build on that and continue continue doing with that. Uh, also getting back to the exams. Uh, so back in, uh, to, to show how successful the uh, uh, female liaison and the, and, the, and the whole recruiting team uh, has been. Uh, the females back in 2018 exam, we, there were 59 people signed up, 59 females. Uh, in 2020, it was up to 129. So uh, we're, we're making strides there. Uh, we're also doing, we're, we're working on videos that, that are gonna help the women uh, with the physical test part of it. And uh, we also ran a, a O2X course uh, back in October, first, first ever. Uh, and it was run by, so O2X is, is a group run by uh, ex-Navy SEALs, former Navy SEALs, I shouldn't call them X, you never X. Uh, and they deal with uh, physical fitness, uh, mental health, stress, resiliency, nutrition, sleep, uh, you know, how to sleep properly. Uh, it's a great thing. And I had them uh, uh, write a program specifically for women. Uh, so it was a huge success. Uh, geez, I think we had uh, 45 women uh, and, and 14 of those we invited from other departments. Uh, so we started a networking with the women, uh, whereas, you know, a lot of these departments outline, I'll say like Revere or, you know, uh, Chelsea or whatever, they, they may have one or two women. So this was a great opportunity for them to, to uh, meet with our women and, and they can just, you know, talk women to women. Uh, I don't know what they talk about, but uh, but anyways, they uh, uh, it was a great, it was really a great success. I had nothing but uh, good reports back on that, and that that's uh, something that we're looking to do every year uh, for the women and expand on that. Uh, they they really loved it, so uh, I'm very happy and proud that that we were able to do that. So, uh, and in the future, uh, the Boston Fire Department, it's my hope that we can have a dedicated team of recruiters uh, for outreach events uh, for year round recruiting uh, on a consistent basis. But, you know, as, as with everything, uh, it's a budget issue. So, uh, uh, but, but we'll do our best. Uh, that's all I have for right now. If you have any questions on that. No, thank you, Commissioner. Um, who was here first? I can't remember. Shane, what's the order again? 
So I'm pulling it up right here. I, I be believe it was Councilor Mejia. Okay, Councilor Mejia, right. you have the floor. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but, no, but I mean, it, no, it was very informative and I really do appreciate all the data. Um, and so I'll just keep my questions really brief. Um, I'm just curious in terms of what languages are spoken by public safety officials. How does language competency determine um, where um, our, our officers are stationed? And does the city ask for language competency when looking for prospect um, applicants? And can you just speak a little bit to the language cert certification process? What, what does it look like? How are applicants certified? And then I'm also curious in terms of, I understand all of your outreach efforts. I'm curious as to whether or not you have a survey um, that is shared with the public um, so that they can tell you how they're experiencing the, the hiring recruitment process so that you can get some feedback. And then based on what you hear from those who are trying to navigate, um, that you can tweak your uh, recruitment efforts accordingly to how people are receiving the information that they're getting. And I'm just curious if, there, if there's a survey that exists. And then I'm just wondering, one thing is to recruit and the other is to retain. I'm curious about what your retention strategies look like um, and what type of environments are we creating for people of diverse backgrounds um, so that they can feel fully embraced um, once they are entered into one of our departments. And then what is your um, track towards um, stepping up the ladder, you know? I know that oftentimes there's requirements and certifications, but I'm just curious about like, how are we reducing the hardships for a lot of folks who are trying to reach quote unquote the top? I know I asked a lot of questions and I don't remember half of them because they're all coming out from right top of here. But um, I hope one of y'all are taking notes because I do expect some answers <laughs> from some of the questions that I've asked, thanks. Madam Chair, do you want me to? Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. I think um, uh, where we have the language. Uh, that's right. I mean, I think the language for you, the police department. I mean, it's it's critically important for the diversity piece. So that'd be great if you and maybe Michael want to speak to it or Chief Tavares. Thank you, okay. Commissioner. Uh, okay. Uh, so, Councilor Mejia, we uh, we went to civil service and and. Uh, Connie uh, Wong had to uh, kind of beat them up over getting the cert, but we finally got what we wanted. Uh, we get it on a regular basis. And we are now uh, up to uh, five separate languages that, that we, uh, the, the, the five uh, main languages that are spoken in the city, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cape Verdean. So uh, those are the five uh, languages that we draw on. Uh, uh, is, does that answer your question on, on that? Or do you have more to ask on that? Uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a special, it's a, it's a separate uh, certification list. So it's different and we can pick from that list. Uh, once again, it, it goes by score and uh, uh, it's separate from the other uh, list of, of uh, recruits, potential recruits. Okay, so I'm curious in regards to um, the other questions. Okay, so, uh, the uh, recruiting question as far as the uh, survey, I think we have to uh, We'll have to work on that. I'm not sure if we actually do that. Um, maybe, maybe Chief Tavares, um, okay. because that's a question that goes across different right. departments. Um, for the, I guess, for the questions that go across a whole host of departments, maybe Chief Tavares can can respond. And then on this, uh, some of the recruiting specifically, whether it's language, which is applicable to uh, fire and police, that would be. Michael, I don't know if you have anything to add in the language piece. Sure, maybe I'll go and then I think Michael can jump in. Um, Kyle, from here, I think the important thing to, to keep in mind about the language uh, preferences is that um, those are approved by the state. And so all we can do is apply to the state for language preferences. And, and, and basically what we have to do is show justification for why we need those. Um, there's not a clear cut process in terms of what HRD is looking for when they approve those waivers. 
I think it's more up to us to make the case as to why, um, why, why we need them, right? And I think it's something we've, we've been going after over the years and we've been more successful with it recently. So I think strategically it's something we're gonna continue to go after. Um, on the question of surveys, I think um, just speaking more broadly across the administration is something we, we've been engaged in. Um, the Public Health Commission has recently launched a survey um, with all individuals for the health agency um, talking about, you know, to your point, how do they feel about working for the city? Um, is there room for upward mobility? Um, you know, just, just anything about working for the city. Uh, the BPDA has launched something um, similarly. And also what we're doing is uh, we brought on a consultant um, that's going to roll out racial equity trainings across all the, uh, across the administration. And part of their efforts is not only going to be um, outreach within the administration, but also in the public. You know, what do you expect to see from your government? What are the priorities that I think aren't being touched on, right? So to your point, that engagement is going to drive a lot of our policies going forward. Um, so I do think part of that yeah. strategy should be used in our public safety agencies. Yeah, so I just wanna be clear in terms of what I'm, in regards to the survey. It's not just those folks who are already working um, for the city. I'm curious about those who have tried or, or have gone through um, career fairs or have gone through the, uh, the interview process. I'm curious about what their experience has been as those who have not been employed uh, or yeah. hired to work, just to understand what their experience has been like and what can we learn about their um, journey uh, in yeah. this process to help improve the recruitment process and is what I'm trying to get at. And to your point, Counselor, um I think you actually showed up to one of the neighborhood career fairs we had launched in Mattapan. Um, in that process, what we do is, you know, as we're trying to connect um, external stakeholders to some, you know, private companies that may not be the city, what, what we've done is, to your point, is ask them directly about what's worked and what hasn't. And, and a lot of the feedback we've gotten during those process um, helped us guide, you know, future events, you know, whether it's making sure that events were centrally located near um, transportation, right? Whether, what, what are those best times to do it, right? Is it after work or is it on a Saturday morning where individuals have more uh, availability, right? What are the types of jobs they want us um, to come equipped with? What were some of the barriers they had, right? Should we have computers on site so they can do applications on site? So, so to your point, a lot of that engagement um, is what we've been doing and sort of driving our policies going forward. But, but yes, we do need to do more of that. Yeah, I think it would be helpful if um, once you get the feedback, if there's a way for you all to share it with the council so that we can see how um, the recruitment process is going and how people are experiencing. And the last question, I mean, I had more than that than these, but I'm curious if you could just talk to me a little bit about the retention. I, I do know that, you know, this is really about the recruitment and increasing our numbers, but I'm just curious if you could talk to what efforts are made uh, to create an environment where people of color in particular want to stay um, within these city agencies? And, and the, I'd like to know a little bit about the environment that, our, that people are um, navigating. Yeah, I think, you know, just to touch broadly on the retention question, um, I think that's something we always think about, you know, just not in public safety, but across the administration. I, th I think one thing that's been difficult for us as we look at data, I think the farther you go back on data, I think the more you find out it's, um, you know, we don't have the best data. It's sort of, you know, how do we define, you know, um, how, how we're capturing this information. So part of what we're working on now, to your point, is with HR um, and with our team to figure out, you know, what does that all mean? What does it mean to retain someone? How do you capture that? Um, um, anecdotically, but also through data, you know, how do we capture, um, you know, how do we define retention, right? How do we tell that story? Um, and, and how do we find better metrics to be able to, you know, tell when we've been able to capture and retain that employee? So, so I think that's something we're, we're thinking about strategically, um, but trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we best, you know, even capture that data? Mm -hmm. uh, Chief Tavares, do you know why people leave? Why, why do, I know you're like, what's that question? Let me just, um, I'm just curious, you know, if, do you, when you, do you ever do exit interviews um, when uh, some, or um, let's say for instance, uh, someone has been a police officer for 15 years and they haven't reached the ranks. Um, do you have any, any kind of like 
any data that goes to show how long it takes a person of color to go from being a police officer to, I don't know what's the next thing, like a sergeant or, or a captain and then a deputy, I don't know the ranks, but I'm just curious, what's the longevity um, for someone to actually reach the ranks? I don't have that data uh, readily available, but but I did do things to your points. Th those are data sets in analysis we should be looking at. Um, so so I, I agree with the point that, you know, we could be looking at all, all different metrics on, on, ret on its retention. But one thing we find is that, you know, with, with the workforce of 20,000 plus employees, a lot of our employees aren't necessarily leaving. They're, 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 they're moving across departments, right? And so for us, that's another piece of, you know, how do you count those employees that may be going from one job and, and they're just going across departments to the next, um, you know, but, but it, it's just a beginning conversation on, on a whole bunch, bunch of this data. Um, but to your point, you know, it, it is an sort of exploratory conversations about how do we capture these, these things. Yes, I, I do believe so. That's the case. And I know that I want to be mindful that I have other colleagues that have to go. Um, and so I don't know, Councilor Campbell, if there'll be another round of questions or an Absolutely. opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell, um, for your leadership on this important issue. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, just, just hearing some of the numbers um, about the Asian community at the Boston Public, at uh, the police, the fire, and EMS. Do you think overall we have a enough Asians in those three departments, and if, and if we don't, what can we do to increase that? What type of specific um, retention or what type of specific uh, recruiting can we do on, on Asian police, fire, and EMS? Council, just to speak broadly, I think um, I think if you look at any of these agencies, what you're going to find is that when it comes to the Asian population, the applicant pool is very um, um, slim, and so I think all these agencies are dealing with the they're operating from a space where there isn't a large selection pool. So, so I think the first strategy you need to figure out is how do we increase those numbers to make sure we have more individuals applying, so that we can give these departments more access to the actual candidates. Um, some, some of the tools we've mentioned, I think, you know, will, will help with that piece. The cadet programs allows us to sort of um, get more diversity in the, in the applicant pool so that we have more access to some of these kids. Um, the residency requirement, again, um, potentially larger class sizes. I, I think, you know, the farther you get down on, on sort of um, civilian list, the more diversity you have there. Um, so, I, so I think it's a little bit of everything. And, and I don't think it's sort of, um, you know, sort of a one size fits all. I don't know if any, any public safety agencies want to jump in on that. I'll say um, one thing that we find, you know, we partnered with the Asian Civic Association and other uh, groups to kind of have roundtable discussions around this. Uh, from a police department standpoint, there's a lot of cultural uh, work that needs to be done in terms of the honor and integrity of police officers and how they're looked at um, in various countries. And so we have found that um, that type of behind the scenes work is helpful, but um, um, civil service, we've partnered with civil service on their uh, posters as well. And they've actually posted, uh, uh, they've created posters in different languages. Um, so that way we, we can try to uh, address perhaps the, uh, the person that's in the home that's influencing decisions to, to be able to read a poster uh, in, in a language that they're familiar with and now influence that child. So um, our, our hope is to kind of chip away at this, but it's, it's, there's more of a, of a cultural divide as it relates to uh, the Asian population, I think, uh, and uh, law enforcement in particular. Um, and these are conversations that I've had with uh, deputies and others in, in our department um, from, from that uh, uh, background. Council from the uh, uh, fire department side, uh, a lot of us comes from the language uh, cert right now. Uh, but uh, if you don't mind, I'll let 
Connie Wong, uh, where she deals with the language cert a lot, she can uh, expand on this. Uh, thanks, Connie. You're on mute. I can't hear you. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, did not realize that. So I'll try to remember what I just said and I'll repeat it. But thank you, Councillor Campbell, for hosting this and Councillor Flynn for that question. Um, the language certs was uh, something that I was looking into when I first started, uh, came back in 2014 and 2015 was my first um, hiring cycle, uh, looking at what we can do to increase diversity and what was legally permissible within the bounds of civil service hiring laws. Language search certainly came to mind. So I started with Spanish and Haitian Creole um, petitions to HRD and slowly built it up, adding Chinese and Vietnamese. Last year, I got all five top languages, uh, including Cape Verdean for the city of Boston and, um, and the fire department. And this year, the same thing. I think when it comes to um, increasing the diversity or let's say the specific question to Councillor Flynn's question about increasing Asians. It is one thing we have to tackle is imparting the knowledge, um, the different pathways um, that are permissible within the current civil service laws, how you can get on police or fire. And what I have found, because I mean, I'm an American born Chinese. I grew up in Boston, grew up in Chinatown, speak three different Chinese dialects. But I know that even within my own community, there is a lack of knowledge in how to navigate civil service. So they don't know about language preferences. They don't know about residency. They don't know about age requirements. Knowing that, you know, there's a lot of veterans that get preference right now, even amongst Asian veterans, um, my dad is a part of the Chinatown American Legion Post. I've tackled them to try to get more recruits or potential applicants just as part of our own overall outreach and recruitment. There's a dearth of kids. And then even when there are the kids, they either do not meet residency or they do not meet age or, you know, they meet all that and they're willing to be a Boston firefighter, but, um, they either don't speak the language sufficiently to pass because we use a third party vendor for transparency purposes to assess the language proficiency or they don't meet the residency. And I'll, I'll give you an example. One of the kids who wanted to apply um, did not move into Boston, even though he is a DAV, because none of his family live in this area anymore and he is homeless. So he lives in um, outside of the city somewhere he's familiar with to sleep in his car because then he knows the streets where the cops won't come and kick him away. So that is another hurdle. So for some of the demographics that we're trying to pursue, they have more than just one issue about how do they get on. It's, it's multi-pronged. Some of it is age, some of it is residency, but I would say above all, it is the lack of knowledge how to navigate civil service. That is what I have found in the last five years. It's a lack of knowledge. So we have to do a better job going out into those communities and teaching them what the hiring process is really all about. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. And thank you, um, Connie. I have great respect for you and, and for your family. And I always spend a lot of time with your father with the American Legion post um, especially at this time, they do an outstanding uh, Christmas drive for kids in the neighborhood, the Chinatown American Legion Post. So just want to say thank you to, um, to you and your family. Um, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank my, you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. My final question, maybe it's to uh, Chief Tavares. Um, Chief, on the Boston police recruitment, um, I know you highlighted the BPS might be getting some consideration as it as it relates to BPS graduates as it relates to hiring preference. Um, I, I highlighted the other graduates that are not BPS. I have a tremendous school in my district, for example, Cathedral High School, and, and there's probably not a more diverse school um, in the city. Um, it's probably several, but there's 
it, it, it's, it's high up there. Um, high, it's probably about 95% Latinx and African-American. Um, but I, I think it's important also to recognize those students that they should be, if, if there is a BPS preference, I, I would like to see us do some outreach and work in, in, and include those types of private schools. Are, are, are we set in stone that it's only BPS? No, no, Councilor. I think I think the recommendation is to look at civil service um, as a whole. But but to your point, I, I do think you know um, it's where the conversation of looking at these schools who fall outside of the BPS jurisdiction. Um, and then the other question has been posed is, a, is also looking at um, language preference as a potential um, tool um, going forward for, for these kids as well. Um, so to your point, no, I, I don't think it's set in stone that it's going to be BPS only. Um, if that is. Okay, I, th I think I think it's I think it's important that we include in the discussion private schools such as such as the cathedral. Uh, it's in the heart of my district, and it's 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 again it's mostly made up of African American and Latinx students, the South End Roxbury area. Um, so I would obviously I would have to support um, out of out of basic fairness. Um, making sure that they're part of the, you know, part of the, part of this issue as well. So I, I hope we can work on that issue going forward, Chief. Yeah, I'll definitely take that back, Counselor, but uh, I, I don't disagree with the point. Okay, um, I have no further questions. Thank you, Counselor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Counselor Flynn. Counselor Flaherty. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and obviously it's great to see um, uh, all the committed folks in front of us uh, today. Uh, I have a couple thoughts. Um, obviously, wanted to um, wanted to um, address the, and it's kind of the issue that I've been uh, talking about for for a little while, um, which is the um, it's the well. Let me let me let me just make an introductory comment because I came on just a little late. I'll just say that uh, first of all, thank you. Um, Chairwoman Campbell for hosting and sponsoring. I think it's critically important across all ranks of, of public safety agencies that they reflect the rich diversity of our city and that uh, that they know the neighborhoods, that they can speak the language of our residents, that um, they look like our residents, they understand the lived experience of our residents here in the city. Uh, our public safety jobs are some of the higher paying jobs uh, in the city, good salaries, good benefits, good working conditions. And uh, I wanna have, I want all of our residents to, to have uh, those jobs. So. Uh, the city's made investments over the past few years to, to recruit and retain uh, a more diverse workforce, which I'm sure uh, the panelists, um, you know, as they have, they've described it in detail. So we're going to continue to make those efforts uh, to continue to make headway. And so I appreciate everyone's efforts to date, particularly the council. I know the council has been on this, but there's just two areas that I wanted to highlight. And one is the mattress address, which is um, we currently have legislation pending up at Beacon Hill to move the residency requirement from one year to three years before you can sit for the uh, for the uh, civil service exam. Um, that has been supported uh, by uh, our patrolmen, our detectives, our superior officers, uh, and uh, Mamlio, as well as our commissioner. And, uh, and with respect to the fire, it's been also supported by 718 and the Vulcans and the commissioner. And it's just sitting up at Beacon Hill um, and needs a push. That will probably, um, be a, that'll, that'll do uh, tremendous. Uh, make it's a, it's a make the lift a lot easier, I should say. Uh, when you could, uh, when we're losing so many seats per academy to folks that don't live in the city, didn't grow up in the city, are not from here, but they moved in, or they've listed a relative's address, uh, an aunt or a grandparent or a cousin. That is doing a huge disservice to this entire discussion that we're having. And unless and until we cut that off and close that loophole and make sure that those very precious um, uh, academy seats or recruit seats are left for folks that live in the city. And the way we do that is we move the requirement from one year to three year before you can even sit to take the test. That will free up a lot more seats uh, in our class and the recruit classes and the academy classes that will go to city residents that will help foster this discussion. So that's just sort of the first issue. So anyone in their respective circles that if you have relationships up at Beacon Hill, please uh, try to push to have this passed uh, because this, that legislation will go a long way in sort of solving some of these issues. And then the last issue, the second piece is, is on the promotional exams. And I've had discussions in the past, 
and I know the chairwoman and I have discussed this ad nauseum uh, in the past as well, particularly when she was council president, is you guys have a good vantage point. You know the men and women of your departments. And when you have the promotional exam, there's opportunities uh, to go into um, and to, to make those appointments, but we're, our hands are tied and they're mostly tied because of budgetary constraints. And I just think in our wisdom, we have the opportunity because what happens is for those that don't understand, after you take the civil service test and it's certified, it only lasts for so long. So many people die on the list, uh, very capable men and women um, and, and particularly people of color that are on sort of the sergeant's list or the lieutenant's list or the captain's list or uh, or the deputy list. And, and we, we just need to make like one or two more appointments. And I know it's a, an upfront capital expenditure, uh, ex up, upfront expenditure in terms of our overall operating, but sometimes it's worth it uh, to sort of satisfy sort of the overall goals and objectives. And unfortunately, year in and year out, um, people are basically dying on the civil service list only to have to sort of start the process over, only to have to take the test again and then to have to get ranked again. And in our wisdom, I think that we have the opportunity to solve those problems. Unfortunately, it's going to take, it's, a, it's really a budgetary issue. And I just think if we, if we were a little bit more judicious about it and we saw and seized those opportunities, whether it's on the police or the fire or EMS, where we have the ability to make a couple additional appointments, somehow, some way, we're going to have to find something for them to do in the, in the interim. But um, I think that would be well served as a city by making those additional appointments and getting uh, to those individuals before their score um, dies on the list. And again, this is something that we've banged our heads on uh, over the last several years where we had the opportunity, if we could just dip down a little bit and, and make some additional appointments, uh, we would have been able to put uh, people of color in positions, uh, in decision-making positions and in positions of, of leadership and authority that would, I think, to Connie Wong's point, would foster uh, a, a lot in terms of just being able to recruit and to, uh, to have folks uh, be able to point to and to look up to and consider maybe signing up and joining the ranks of EMS or, or fire or police. So not everyone wants to run into a burning building. Not everyone wants to uh, chase a suspect down, down a dark alley late at night um, and have to make a life and decision, life and death decision whether to discharge a firearm. And not everyone wants to be in the back of, a, of an ambulance, um, again, trying to save someone's life while they're bleeding out or they're in the middle of a, a cardiac event. So it's a special person uh, that wants to do these jobs. And I just want to make sure that we're providing the best opportunity for all of our kids across the city to compete and to do that. And one way is to, again, eliminate that loophole, extend the residency from one year to three years before you can even sit for the test. And two, in leadership, be a little bit more judicious around appointment time and look at those lists, those civil service lists, and see where the rankings are, and and maybe make an additional appointment or two to be able to get, you know, to uh, a, a person of color or, or a woman um, and get them into the, the fold and put them into a leadership position. So I know I'm opining on it, Madam Chair. You and I have discussed this. I know that the individuals that are on this Zoom know it well, um, and sometimes we just have to to give them the the resources um, to make those appointments to to get the diversity that we're looking for as opposed to allowing those scores to sort of die on the list and uh, it's an absolute travesty particularly when you have someone that's extremely capable and experienced that have paid their dues uh, and they're a good leader and to watch their name and their number and their score just die on the list because we didn't have the the resources or the budget capacity to to make an additional appointment or two to be able to get to them, to get them into the fold. So that's my two cents on it. And I think if we did both pass the legislation and give our commissioners the ability to, to look at that list and to maybe make an additional appointment or two, um, that would go a long way in solving this, this entire issue. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Um, I'm just being mindful of time. Technically, you know, we, we slated this to end at three. I know we got started late. Um, so of course, we'll, I'm glad you lifted that up. And, um, and then, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. I think we all recognize just from the numbers alone that there's still much work to be done to ensure our, our agencies, of course, are reflective of the demographics of the city. Um, I just quickly wanted to go through Chief Tavares. Obviously, you know, I put out this report a couple of years ago, working in partnership with most folks on this call um, after hearing from them and, I think we got some updates on the cadet program filed legend. Thank you, Chief Hooley. Um, and Laura was such an, uh, a partner in this work too. Um, you know, the, the, we got an update on the fire cadet legislation. We got updates on um, the numbers, of course, 
the data dashboard piece, you know, we still have some work to do there, civil service, some updates there. Um, I think there's been some discussion because of the recommendations from the mayor's task force on policing on defining not only diversity, but that was a part of the report, not only defining diversity, but also making sure that we have folks to oversee this work across every single department. Um, and I'm just mindful of time, I'm sort of going through some of them quickly, but where I do have some more questions is, one on the promotional exam, you know, there have been conversations for a long time on just the promotional exam, specifically in BPD being um, discriminatory. You know, there's a, there was a legal case on this and officers who were, the court found, you know, should be awarded back pay. So wanted some updates on just promotional exam use, BPD, that legal decision. Um, also, uh, some updates on the hair test piece, right? That's come up in the conversation. We clearly have said we're not going to use it, but it's gone back to the bargaining table. Any updates on the hair test piece um, and any updates on the bypass policy, which also came up in the context of BPD with respect to uh, possibly limiting diversity um, that came up during some of our conversations too. Yeah, Councilor, I, I don't have, um any updates on the hair test policy. Um, okay. but, I, but I do think in, in terms of the bypass, it, it might be helpful um, for Michael to talk about the current bypass policy um, in terms of what it currently is um, and any, any changes, Mike, that we have made. I, I know in terms of, um, you know, this may not speak specifically to the bypass policy, but, you know, in my line, I come across a lot of um, kids who, are interested in in BPD as a career, and there have been instances, for example, where you connect them with Mike. Um, it may have been a small infraction that's keeping them, and they get bypassed. Um, but 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 what's different this time around, and, mm -hmm. and I hope Michael could talk about it, is the work we've done to number one is pull those kids back in, right? Bring them through the roundtable process and have a discussion about you know what is it there that you know to make sure that we're not bypassing them from misdemeanor issues for example a driving record right you may have a driving infraction that's um getting you held up in the process right there may be a question around you applied one time right there may have been a question around you know were you ever arrested and you answered no right that's un untruthfulness right that may have been held against you in the past going forward right and, and i think at least having um and i'm not sure if it's an official policy but having michael in that space has at least helped us to at least take a closer look on a case by case basis. I think to your point, we need a, a better policy to make sure it's not happening across the board so that by chance, if you don't, if you don't know Michael and he had, and he doesn't have the ability to look at your particular case, you're not being disqualified. Um, so Michael, I don't know if you can touch a little bit more on, on that policy there. Yes, sir. Well, um, for the, for the hair test in particular for the department, um, one, we, we immediately went to a, a urine test for our recruit applicants. Um, as we call for the list uh, for the next uh, iteration uh, coming up, we'll be continue to use the uh, urine uh, test until we get uh, news otherwise. Uh, as it relates to, the, you, um, to our bypasses, um, one, uh, again, coming in in 2017, um, I did an analysis of the number of bypasses and the reasons that people were being bypassed. We don't have a disparate impact on any specific group as it relates to uh, bypasses. I think what's important to understand is the decisions that we make as it relates to bypasses um, and as it relates to um, promotional exams. Uh, you, you mentioned the promotional exam. I want to make sure I touch on that, but we, we relate both to the, the actual job function. So uh, I, someone's not gonna be bypassed if they have one speeding ticket. They, they'll be bypassed if they have uh, an NSE class, which means you have a certain number of infractions within a short amount of time. And uh, so that puts into question your, your driving and, or the judgment behind the wheel. That's directly related to the job function. So we're gonna bypass that candidate. It's not a no forever but it's a no for a period of time. If they show better judgment over a period of time of say five years past the NSC class, then um, they're able to, um, to um, perhaps proceed through the, through the interview process. So it's important that, that, that the, this, this uh, body understands that we're, we're not making arbitrary decisions as it relates to uh, people's 
uh, backgrounds and whether or not they would be suitable to be police officers. We have pretty hard line um, areas. Um, if you have a felony, you, know, you, you cannot by law be a police officer. Um, but if you have fel felonious conduct, it doesn't necessarily disqualify you. But what we're going to be looking at are, are patterns of behavior and, and things that you've done uh, throughout your, uh, your, your time up until the point we're uh, reviewing that application to determine whether or not you're bypassed. If you are bypassed, every applicant, will get, we give the information that they have the right to appeal that bypass. Uh, the commission um, will, will review that, Civil Service Commission reviews that. If they uphold it, the bypass, then it's a no. It, it, oftentimes it may, may not be a no forever. But um, Do all it, the appeals go through the Civil Service? Only if the uh, applicant themselves uh, appeal the process. Um, and and many, many applicants um, um, partner with some of our affinity groups, uh, MAMLIO um, mm -hmm. and the lawyers, uh, I think they, they change it again, LC. J. LCR, yep. LCR, yep. They, um, they, you know, would be happy to work with a lot of the applicants in terms of um, uh, their bypass and, and, and helping them th through that process. So we're, we're not making any arbitrary decisions. We have a standard operating procedure that we like to- What would uh, be helpful is, Michael, if you could send us that, because I think it came up in conversations before, but we, we mm -hmm. didn't, we never had a written policy or process or procedures attached. Mm -hmm. So if you could send that, um, to the council, that would be great as something we can share and review just what the policy is, what the review process is, essentially what you were talking about now. Um, yes, that would be helpful um, to us. Yes, ma'am. And, and lastly, with regard to uh, the promotional exams, um, recently in, in press conferences, uh, when, when you have BPD representatives talking about the uh, fairness of an exam, there's an ongoing lawsuit that's from 2008. Um, we've had two exams since then, including our most recent exam, which are different processes. Um, we uh, did a, an analysis of the, the actual job function. Um, we had subject matter experts, which are people that are in positions uh, that are get, being tested with internally within the department, uh, create a survey and answer a survey to uh, determine uh, the, the different components of, of an exam and how we can best assess our, our uh our, our supervisors, as, as well as uh, the weight that's going to be associated with each component. So now uh, we have a, a written test, uh, we have a, um, a uh, in basket or a scenario, um, and then we have an oral board, which is someone um, actually um, uh, uh, reporting to or responding to a scenario and, and almost like on the job and how you what you would do and what judgment you would exercise. Um, we feel like that is a, is a fair process. We feel when that, was that, that when were those changes made, Michael? Uh, we this 20, 2020, um, this exam that we're, we're administering now, we have that. And in 2015, they, we also had an oral component to it. So it's not just a written test and your education and experience. And it's not just the 80 20 uh, split. Um, there, there are uh, percentages uh, weighted. Uh, toward uh, each component, and these percentages uh, relate to the job analysis. So, if uh, if our supervisors are saying that communication is is really key, um, there's going to be more weight on the oral board in your presentation as opposed to the written test. And so, uh, we look to continue to, to evolve and continue to look at best practices across the nation to make sure that we can uh, administer fair exams. Um, and again have a, a good uh, robust applicant pool so we can draw from that applicant pool and, and make uh, good supervisors. Um, two questions and then I'm going to go back to Council Mejia who I know is patiently waiting before we wrap up because I know it's getting late um, so I appreciate you guys. Um, on So actually on the promotional piece so that case right uh, is that case done with have we appealed that case what's the status right now of that case specifically on the promotional exams? Um, again that's a uh, I, I don't have uh, information on where they are with that, um, okay. but, but I, I would say that they, they didn't find that the initially they didn't find the, 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 the test was unfair or, or, or had any uh, bias to it. Um, again, um, they're going to go back and forth. All, we're concentrating on the 2020 exam. We were informed by our past exams and, and feedback. No, no, that's helpful. I mean, I, I think there was some who suggested they 
the case was did find the exams to be discriminatory more than once and ordered back pay. So, but I can separately follow up on that piece, Michael, mm -hmm. to counsel's office. But this is this this update around promotional exams generally is helpful. My last piece, you know, in the report talks a lot about the culture of the department, which I think other counselors were getting at too. I'm curious, you know, the fire department, others have talked about doing racial equity trainings, various things. What departments have done what in that vein to shift culture? And then I'm, that's my last question before I go to Council Mejia. Councilor, what I would say to that is um, we're in the process now of rolling out our racial equity training um, with our consultant. Um, what I like about the way we're doing this training, it's, um, it's very thorough in terms of the consultants are taking their time to really drill down on the departments and understand what the needs are. So a lot of one-on-one -on -one engagement, um, a lot of engagement with the public. Um, we plan on rolling out those trainings beginning in March. Um, in the meantime, for I know- all, For which departments? All, all the part of- all That'll be for all, that'll be for all departments, um, including our, our public safety agencies. Um, the other piece I'll mention is that, um, you know, not only have we added a chief equity officer and sort of building out that shop, we're also building out the equity shops in all of our public agency offices. Mm -hmm. Um, and put in more resources. And so, for example, uh, one of the calls that came from the police task force recommendation was building out the equity um, offices within BPS, B BPD. Um, and I know those are recommendations we're looking to move on. Um, so, so I would just say, you know, on the culture piece, we have a lot more work to do. Um, we recognize yeah. that. Um, and we know that the trainings we're going to do are going to be a part of a series for, of trainings because we know the public safety agencies are more specific and so their trainings have to align with obviously their functions. So this will be, you know, um, a piece of sort of, um, sort of the, the larger work we plan on doing going forward. Well, I would just push it, you know, on that timeline because I know we've been talking to departments about this. They understand the importance and how it has to be tailored to their specific departments and needs. Um, but I know that was a big topic of discussion or for, for some time amongst counselors uh, for, for specifically not only with respect to the fire department, but also some of uh, the other departments too. Council Mejia. Hi, yes, thank you. This has been very um, educational. I um, really do appreciate all the chiefs um, and Councilor Campbell for her leadership in this space. I just have one quick question. I'm going back to uh, just the, the way people are experiencing our various departments. Uh, and I'm just curious as to whether or not um, you all have a system in place to provide feedback to folks who didn't get hired, um, what information is shared with folks, what technical assistance is provided um, to folks so that they can reapply. Is there a, a mechanism in, in place to, um, to kind of shepherd people along this process? Yeah, Council, what I would say to that is, um, you know, in, in our water and sewer agency, we had this issue of, um, you know, people feeling undervalued and feeling like they didn't have the opportunity to sort of move up the ranks. And I, and I think to your, your point, one thing we did um, to, to, to try to address that was, um, you know, expand trainings for everyone across the board so that when these, when these positions became available, um, that we had folks in line who were able to do the job. Right. So, so that's one way we were able to sort of um, to sort of, you know, make make a little bit of progress um, in that regard. Um, yeah. So I'm more concerned about the folks who um, didn't pass the civil test. Sure. I'm, I'm not I'm less concerned. About, well, I'm concerned about everybody. But I guess my question in particular is about those who did not m uh, I guess, meet the standards of any of the departments um, and what support, um, if any, is provided to folks. Like when you don't get a job, oftentimes like, oh, well, you didn't get a job, bye, <laughs> you know? But I'm just curious, is there like a mechanism in place to say, you know, you tried really hard, you didn't, you, you, you didn't meet the mark, here's five things that I would recommend that you do. And there's just some cultivation because if people already take the initiative to apply um, and they miss the mark, I'm just curious if we have people who are interested, how can we cultivate that batch of applicants? Yeah, and I think to your point, you know, one thing we need to do a better job if it doesn't happen all the time is when, when people, and this doesn't have to just do with public safety, when people are bypassed for jobs, um, 
we need to do a better job of communicating to them why they're bypassed for the jobs. So A, they can know what they need to do for the next time, right? So they can get ready for that. Um, and, and then the other piece I found is that um, there's, al there's always a thirst for sort of knowledge, especially when it comes to employees of color, of trying to find that person or that mentor that they can go to to talk about, hey, what did you do to sort of um, get to where you are and sort of, so, so one thing we've really tried to do is sort of build out our employee resource groups, which has been really helpful in, in connecting people who, who may have been sort of siloed out, people who worked in transportation their whole careers or water and sewer their whole careers who, who may not get to cross collaborate a, a lot of it. And, and that, what that's done is, is it's exposed our leadership to a lot of younger individuals, people who were Donnie Tavares five, six years ago who I may be able to mentor and really created that sort of network across the administration. So I think, A, we need to do a better job of anytime anyone is bypassed, explaining to them why they were bypassed. It, it also does a lot to sort of cultivate the fear that people of color are being bypassed um, for sort of minute, minuscule reasons and, the, and they're actually qualified for these jobs. So when you go to someone and say, hey, you weren't bypassed because of race, it's because this person has been in the job 21 years and, and they beat you off seniority, right? That goes a long way in sort of building culture within the, uh, within the administration so people know they're valued um, and, so, and people hear them. Um, so to, to your point, I think that's something we're working on, but we're also working to build out this mentorship piece within the, within the building. So people have someone they can turn to, right, and say, hey, here's what I'm dealing with. Um, can you help, right? Okay, that's it, Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Chief Tavares. I really do appreciate your input and look forward to um, being a partner. I'm the chair of workforce development. Um, I think that we should be able to work more closely together to address some of these concerns. So thank no, you. No, that's right. And thank you, Council Mejia. You know, when we, we started this work, it wasn't just, of course, to get at diversity in the departments to build trust and community, but also recognizing these are high paying jobs that people want um, Boston residents dream of getting, right? And so doing everything we could to, re to eliminate any barriers to access specifically for women and people of color. So thank you, Council Mejia. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. C thank you, Councilor Campbell. And thank you to the panelists that are here that provided excellent um, recommendations, feedback, and what you're working on. Um, just wanted to highlight one issue that I failed to mention when I was talking to Deputy Commissioner um, Wong from the Fire Department. Um, I know you referenced a individual, Connie, that was a homeless disabled veteran. And as a disabled veteran myself, um, I should have mentioned to you that um, if that disabled veteran needs, I know he's homeless, if he needs help, um, please let me know. And there's a lot of great programs for homeless veterans here in Boston. So I didn't want to let that pass without saying that. So okay. you have my, you have my number. So if you want to give me a call, but I, I want to make sure we try to help that homeless veteran if we can. Great. Thank you. Certainly I'll pass that on. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Campbell. No, thank you, Councilor Flynn, and thank you for your leadership and partnership, specifically on the, the veterans issue and bringing that unique perspective. Appreciate you. Um, and obviously, we are way past time, so I don't want to drag, drag this on any longer. I know how busy all of you are. Um, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for being a part of the conversation. Um, I see, actually, Councilor Braden, are you back on? Did you want to say a few words? I know you had to step off and Step I had to, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm no listening. Um, I'm listening in. Um, I had to step off for a little while. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for the discussion this afternoon. Um, I think, as I mentioned, this is a hugely important issue, and um, they're making our, our um, uh, public safety uh, personnel having a more diverse workforce is is really. Um, um, a, a very important issue in, when we live in such a diverse city. So um, I'm looking forward, I, I applaud all the efforts that have, are being executed right now to advance this issue. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you all to do what I can to uh, help in the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for your partnership as well. Um, and thank you all for participating. Shane, do we have anyone uh, here for public testimony? No, we don't. We're all set, Madam Chair. Okay. 
Um, so thank you all. Obviously, we'll continue to stay in contact with you guys as we work in partnership with the administration, council colleagues on doing everything we can to remove any barriers to folks uh, trying to obtain these jobs, of course. Um, and we want to support you in any way. Appreciate your leadership. Um, you know, obviously, was taking a lot of notes on the collaboration across departments, language preference. The battle with the state is real, so I appreciate the fight uh, with respect to each and every one of you on, on those issues. Um, and Chief Tavares will obviously stay in touch with you on, on pieces of the report, but also the recommendations from the task force as well, which are critically important and relate. Everyone stay safe and healthy. Enjoy the holiday season. Continue to take care of yourselves. And I extend my gratitude along with all of my council colleagues with respect to uh, you guys being first responders. Um, we don't take that for granted. In the, in the midst of this pandemic. So thank you to each and every one of you for the work you do. And we'll see you um, at the next hearing. So thank you, this hearing is adjourned. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Councilor.